I have the greatest admiration for Princetonians for Free Speech and for the Princeton Free Speech Union Project, which is a project of Princetonians for Free Speech. Uh, those of you who are not familiar with Princetonians for Free Speech, I would encourage you to take the flyers that uh, are out there on the front desk, which will give you an idea of what Princetonians for Free Speech is about. You can also follow the organization uh, on Facebook and on Twitter, and I think the one in the middle is Instagram, but I'm not on Instagram, so I'm not sure if that is in fact right. Uh, you can get involved with Princetonians for Free Speech. It's basically an alumni uh, organization, but my understanding is that they're a little loose about that and welcome support and help from anywhere they can get it. So even if you're not a formal Princeton uh, alumnus, uh, I hope you'll become involved in Princetonians for Free Speech. And what a delight and a pleasure it is to welcome to Princeton my dear friend and uh, great free speech champion, Nadine uh, Strassen. Uh, I'm going to let Nadine introduce herself. We decided that this evening we'll just introduce our, ourselves. But I do want to begin by saying how uh, honored I feel uh, to be presenting and in conversation uh, with Nadine, who has been just a great warrior for free speech on campus and beyond. And the title of tonight's discussion is Civil Liberties on Campus and Beyond. And the, the main civil liberty that we're going to be focused on this evening uh, is freedom of uh, speech. By way of introduction, for those who don't know me, I'm the Plymouth Professor of Jurisprudence and Director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions uh, here at Princeton. I'm the former chairman of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom and have been a member of the President's Council on Bioethics and the uh, United States Commission on Civil Rights. Uh, my uh, background beyond that is that I grew up in the hills of uh, West Virginia, born and brought up uh, there. Uh, I had a great epiphany that uh, led me to the work I do to my vocation as a scholar and teacher uh, when I was an undergraduate at Swarthmore. Uh, growing up where I grew up as the grandson of uh, coal miners, uh, I had come to think of uh, learning, education, debating as essentially instrumental. Uh, we did these things in order to get ahead. We got an education in order to rise in the world, make more money, have more status, get a prestigious job. Uh, I had also inherited a view of conviction, a belief that was essentially tribal. We believe what our tribe believes. We learn to defend on behalf of our tribe what our tribe thinks. And then in a political theory survey course, in my sophomore year, I was assigned Plato's Dialogue Gorgias. And that's when the epiphany happened. And I realized that I was wrong about both of those things. Yes, knowledge, education, discussion, debate uh, have important instrumental value. Nothing wrong with wanting to improve your condition and station in life, especially if you come from humble origins. But that's not what discussion and debate and education and learning are most fundamentally about. Truth is above all valuable for its own sake, or so I came to believe. So I was convinced, persuaded by that uh, old Greek gadfly Socrates, who I read about in, uh, in Gorgias. Uh, at the same time, I came to see that arriving at one's convictions on a tribal basis didn't make any sense at all. You should believe what you believe because you think about what you should believe, and you follow the evidence and the argument, you use your noggin, you think things through, you talk with people, you learn from people, you debate to get at the truth of matters. Uh, this caused, I think, what we used to call in the old days, uh, when people still remembered names like Sartre and Camus, an existential crisis. <laughs> And I found myself forced to rethink everything that I had believed in religion and morality and uh, politics. And I found that some of my views actually strengthened, didn't change fundamentally. Others of my views did uh, radically change. But I also came to understand not only what my vocation now will be, that's what put me on the road to being a scholar and a teacher, we're making the seeking of truth central to my 
uh, life was the thing to do. Uh, it also enabled me to come to see the importance of freedom as a condition of learning. Freedom of speech, freedom of inquiry, freedom of discussion. That if we're serious about the truth and getting at the truth, and if we recognize, as we absolutely must, our own fallibility, that we can get things wrong, and that we can be wrong not only about the minor and trivial and superficial things in life, but also about the big, important, profound things of life, matters of human dignity, the human good, human rights, if we recognize that we can be wrong about those things, then we will see the importance, the need for freedom, intellectual freedom, freedom of speech and discussion, we see the need for that freedom if we are to be sincere truth speakers and courageous truth speakers, if we're to speak the truth as best we're given to uh, grasp the truth. So it led me to where uh, I ended up uh, here at Princeton and to tonight's uh, forum, where, as I say, I'm so honored to be in dialogue with my friend Nadine. Well, thank you so much, Robbie. I'm kind of smiling because you do what I always do when people ask me to introduce myself, I find I'm shifting toward talking about ideas and about my commitments because that very much is uh, who I am. I think it's, it, I, first of all, I again wa want to echo Robbie's thanks to Princetonians for free speech. This campus really has been a leader on free speech issues in no short measure because of uh, Robbie's leadership with the Academic Freedom Alliance and uh, the Madison Project, and I'll ask you about both of those. Uh, but also, Stuart Taylor's organization has not only been instrumental in mobilizing alumni, which I think are really an undertapped resource for promoting um, the classical liberal values that have been under attack on campuses from both ends of the political spectrum all across the country. Uh, so Stuart got that movement started at Princeton and has tapped in beyond alumni to other constituents of the community, including faculty and students. But he's, his organization has also served as a model and inspiration for alumni groups at uh, campuses around the country. And in fact, um, Stuart is a leader of something called the Alumni Free Speech Alliance. So there is now a coalition of alumni free speech groups. And to those of us who are toiling in the vineyards on campus, it really has been uh, a wonderful support and um, uh, hopefully will continue to spread passion for free speech and open inquiry around uh, campuses. So to introduce myself, uh, I think Stuart did a very good job. Let me just add that I have, as far back as I can remember, been passionately committed to human rights and civil liberties. It's why the ACLU, which I was proud to serve as national president for 18 years, was a natural fit for me as soon as I discovered it because the mission of the ACLU is to defend all fundamental freedoms for all people. No matter who you are, no matter what you believe, you are entitled to full and equal human rights. And of course, those should be guaranteed under the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. But as James Madison, I have to invoke him and with special um, pleasure here in uh, the presence of the founder of the Madison Project. James Madison, the, the chief uh, drafter of both documents, said that they were only parchment barriers between government oppression and individual rights. They're only words on a piece of paper. They're not self-executing, and they depend on real people actually knowing what our rights are, uh, being aware of when government is violating them, and standing up to enforce them. So the ACLU was a natural fit for me. However, in the past uh, half dozen or so years, I have focused almost full time on a, a, a single aspect of the human rights civil liberties agenda, 
and that is the cluster of rights under the First Amendment, freedom of speech, freedom of association, academic freedom, freedom of conscience. And it's not at all because I think those rights are more important than due process and equality and privacy and the whole constellation of other human rights, but rather because my decades of experience here in the United States and working with human rights activists around the world convinces me that without robust freedom of speech, we cannot defend or advance the rest of the human rights agenda, that it is absolutely the most essential prerequisite to have a sufficiently robust concept of free speech, that it extends even, indeed especially, to the most unpopular, controversial, um, hated types of speech, including hate speech and extremist speech and disinformation. Um, and conversely, that censorship is the most effective tool to suppress either the human rights agenda or, for that matter, any other cause that you believe in. So much as I love my students and much as I love teaching, uh, at the end of 2019, I took emeritus status from teaching so that I could commit myself full time to Very speaking well. uh, uh, in, in other venues and to writing in other venues. And let me say, um, this year I have two major projects that are coming to fruition in the fall that I'm very excited about. Uh, one is a new book called Free Speech, What Everyone Needs to Know. It's part of a trademarked series by Oxford University Press. And amazingly, even though the series had existed for about 20 years, there wasn't uh, a book about free speech, what everyone needs to know about it. So that will be out in October. And I've also served as the project consultant and uh, host of a forthcoming, also in the fall, uh, three-part uh, public TV series about free speech. Well, when, when we Americans think about free speech, we naturally think of the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and petition the government for regressive grievances. But notice, the first thing we notice is that it's an amendment. It wasn't part of the original Constitution. Now, it was added very soon after. But we might ask ourselves, well, why was it an amendment? Did they forget to include it the first time, a couple of years, a few years earlier? And of course, the answer to that is no, they didn't forget to include it. That the Federalists, the, in the old sense, there, were, there, there would soon become a second sense of Federalists, the name of a political party, the party of John Adams and Alexander Hamilton, which opposed the party of Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. But the original Federalists, the Federalists in the sense of the people who supported the new draft Constitution, opposed the Bill of Rights, opposed including a Bill of Rights in the Constitution. Can you imagine? They opposed the Bill of Rights? Why did they do that? Did they not believe in freedom? Were they secretly against free speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, the right to petition the government for redress of grievances? And of course, the answer to that question is no. They weren't against it. Well, then, why did they deliberately choose not to include it? And the answer is, those of you who've studied the history, or maybe some of you who have sat in on my courses know, the answer is that from the perspective of people like Hamilton, and originally people like Madison, the protections of fundamental freedoms, including those basic civil liberties that we find now in our First Amendment, were to be found by structuring power in such a way as to minimize the risk of the power being abused. That is, by establishing constitutional structural constraints on power that would prevent violations of freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and so forth. So we find in the Federalist Papers the argument that the Constitution itself, we don't need a Bill of Rights because the Constitution itself is to all intents and purposes a Bill of Rights. But of course not everybody was convinced. 
And so there was immediately pressure to add the specific guarantees which we have in the amendments. But why? Well, the original thought was we'll protect freedom by two important structural mechanisms. The first was by creating a national government that was unlike any other nation's central government. That is a government of delegated and enumerated and therefore limited powers, not a government of general jurisdiction enjoying plenary authority to legislate on any matter it wanted. The general jurisdiction would be left to the states, governments closest to the people. They would exercise what in the British tradition were called police powers to protect public health, safety, and morals and to advance the common good. But the national government, which posed the greatest threat to civil liberty, would be checked by the fact that it was given no power to regulate speech, to establish a church, to restrict religion, to restrict the press. So what do you need? a specific Bill of Rights. And there was the additional worry. If we enumerate some rights, we can't enumerate all of them. There are too many. If we enumerate some, won't that send the message that the others don't exist, because they haven't been listed? And worse yet, won't it send the message not only to the rulers, but to the people themselves, that we're not too serious about restricting power. You can do whatever you want, national government. You can do whatever you want, Congress, so long as you don't trample on these specified protected areas, these protected liberties. The second structural constraint was separating and checking power, our system of checks and balances that you were taught about in civics in high school, at least if you're of a certain age. I don't know if they still teach it. Where we would have the legislature check the legislature, Congress checked by the executive, the president, president checks the Congress, Supreme Court checks both, and so forth. But again, at the end of the day, as a practical political matter, even Madison came to see that we were going to have to have a Bill of Rights. And that's how we got our Bill of Rights in the first place. And of course, the Bill of Rights contains not only the First Amendment, but seven more, depending on what you count as the Bill of Rights, plus two special editions in the ninth and 10th, the ninth indicating that the enumeration of certain rights in this Bill of Rights doesn't mean those are other rights there are. And then the 10th saying that the um, uh, enumeration of powers, certain uh, powers uh, granted to the national government uh, means that the other powers are reserved to the states respectively and the people. So the ninth and 10th are reinforcing the civil liberties guarantees of the uh, original eight, in part by trying to make sure nobody supposes, in virtue of the fact that we adopted a Bill of Rights, that we had abandoned the theory of delegated powers, which the Federalists believed was the most fundamental protection of our rights which was uh, there in the first place. Well, that's a wonderful capsule summary of a lot of constitutional law. I would like to add uh, three points, if I may, Professor. Uh, number one, in addition to the Bill of Rights, the 14th Amendment after the Civil War is, of course, critically important because that, for the first time, uh, the Supreme Court had held, by the way, that uh, the Bill of Rights, I think correctly held, the Bill of Rights did not constrained state and local governments. And there were enormous violations of human rights and civil liberties, not only freedom of speech, but equality and, and the whole spectrum of rights rampantly violated by the states after the Civil War. The 14th Amendment was added and ultimately interpreted as making uh, the First Amendment and other federal constitutional rights applicable and enforceable against the states. So that's point number one of great practical significance. But point number two is, for all of this great constitutional language, the existence of human rights was negligible in this country for most of our history. So the First Amendment is added to the Constitution in 1791. It did not start to be robustly enforced until the middle of the 20th century. 
I mean, when you look at all of the movements for social change throughout our history, starting with abolitionists and women's suffragists and you know, anti-war demonstrators, activists for, um, for, for you know, labor union rights, uh, pacifists, every dissenting group was subjected to enormous censorship and punishment. Uh, despite the existence of the First Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment. Again, these are not self-executing guarantees, uh, any more than the Equal Protection Guarantee added after the Civil War uh, was honored in the breach through Jim Crow and, and lynching, with, often with the uh, conspiratorial involvement of those who should have been protecting against the racist violence. And that is what gave rise to organizations such as the NAACP and the American Jewish Committee and the ACLU early in the 20th century uh, to first inform people about what their rights are, uh, secondly, start to advocate for respect of those, for those rights through legislation and through litigation. Uh, just to, to focus on the actual state of freedom of speech or lack thereof. At the time the ACLU was founded during the uh, World War I era and the Red Scare at that time, 15,000 people were arrested merely for peacefully expressing opposition to the war. And that included Christian ministers who expressed their religious beliefs that uh, they said were, the war was, was inconsistent with. Um, the United States Supreme Court never struck down a federal statute as violating the First Amendment until 1965. And yet we have federal statutes going back to the 18th century, the Notorious Alien and Sedition Act, that clearly were inconsistent with the First Amendment. So I guess I'm wearing a combination of my professor hat and my activist hat, <laughs> uh, you know, education and information about these constitutional rights is the essential prerequisite to the rights being realized. But we have to go beyond into the forum of, of public opinion and advocacy. Now, the third point that I want to make is even assuming that we have very strongly stated free speech and other civil liberties in the Constitution, even assuming we have uh, organizations and individuals that are implementing those rights in the courts and in the legislative tribunals, we still will not have meaningful free speech if there are powerful private sector forces that are suppressing speech. And the reason I say that is many people are surprised to learn the First Amendment and all the other constitutional protections only constrain government. So if it is a private sector actor that is having a speech suppressive or a speech punishing impact, you have no constitutional recourse. You have no constitutional recourse against powerful social media platforms that are uh, discriminating against or deplatforming certain ideas they don't like, certain speakers they disagree with. You have no First Amendment recourse against so-called cancel culture. Uh, the very significant peer pressure and social pressure, including on campuses, that every survey shows is leading to self-censorship. And some kind of self-censorship is good. I'm using, I'm self-censoring any impulse I might hypothetically have to use discourteous language. I don't really have that. <laughs> uh, but you know, we choose our words carefully, right? That is an exercise of free speech. But the poisonous kind of self-censorship that every survey shows is existing in every segment of our population across all identity groups, across all ideological and political groups, uh, is when we refrain from discussing certain really important subjects, and they are sensitive subjects, uh, race and gender and sexual orientation and police practices and immigration and abortion, 
And those seriously are the topics about which um, people are saying, including on campuses, where discussion should be the most robust, not only are they self-censoring certain perspectives for fear that uh, they might be seen as some kind of an ist or some kind of an ope, but they are even refraining from discussing these topics at all. And there is no First Amendment remedy to that kind of very serious uh, speech restriction. Absolutely right. The um, Alien and Sedition Acts were, of course, passed in the Adams administration by the Federalist Congress. This is the same generation that ratified the First Amendment. They somehow didn't see the contradiction. Now, some did. The Jeffersonians did. But by and large, the Federalists did not. It's, it's, it's one of those things that, from our perspective now, we look back and we say, how did they miss it? The way we look at the Declaration of Independence's invocation of equal rights, you know, that all men are created equal, and they think some of the, the very guy who wrote that was a slaveholder. How could, that, how could he have missed that? Right? But there we, there we are. And throughout history, our history, with the First Amendment staring us in the face, we have nevertheless, from time to time, thought this is too urgent, this is too important to let the First Amendment stand in the way. The, the roundups, including of professors, also Christian ministers and other dissenters in the First World War and the Wilson administration, classic case of it. Uh, wasn't exactly a free speech issue, but the internment of the Japanese and Japanese Americans in World War II. It seems so urgent, so critical. You're not going to let something even as sacred in the American consciousness as the Constitution, in this case the due process guarantee, stand in the way. And uh, as, as Nadine uh, uh, knows, uh, when that case came before the Supreme Court of the United States, I'm talking about Korematsu against the United States, when that case, depriving of the due process, the fundamental due process rights of an entire ethnic group, including American citizens, when that came before the Supreme Court, the court's three greatest, most famous civil libertarians of the era, Frankfurter, Black, and Douglas, all voted to uphold the internment. Murphy dissented, one or two other dissents, but it was the great civil libertarians themselves who dropped the ball. It's a lesson to us in this. You know? When we think something is just so urgent, so important, so critical, the risk is so great that maybe we shouldn't look too hard at the Constitution right now, whether it's the due process guarantee, the equal protection guarantee, the free speech guarantee. We should then. That should be the moment when we remember our history. Remember the Alien and Sedition Acts. Remember the, the Red Scare. Uh, remember the Japanese internment. You know, I, I'm, I'm thinking, Ravi, that so many times in my adult lifetime when there has been a new actual or perceived national emergency, the same arguments are made. And you've all heard the phrase, uh, the Constitution is not a suicide pact. Uh, so I remember after 9-11, for example, many people, including people who thought that the Japanese internments were a tragedy and a catastrophe, said, but this is different. You know, this time is really dangerous. And there even were survivors of the Japanese internment camps that came onto national TV programs and, and made exactly the same point. They said, you know, but we were innocent. There was no basis for uh, arresting us. But, you know, all of the terrorists were Muslim. They all came from South Asia or Arab countries. And so that's different. Uh, and uh, I have to tell you, that when the ACLU uh, came to the defense of accused terrorists, so-called enemy combatants who were rounded up and um, incarcerated, many of them here in New Jersey, 
um, and also in New York and held completely incommunicado, we were attacked as being unpatriotic, exactly as we had been in the Korematsu era um, when the ACLU was defending the Japanese Americans. And I remember uh, at New York Law School, where I was then full-time teaching, we are very close to the World Trade Center. And uh, so it was almost like a, a military zone. You weren't allowed into the school unless you could sh show identification that you were part of the school community. And I had hate mail that was tagged onto my door that was slid under, you know, basically saying, you know, leave the United States, you're a traitor, you don't belong here. And I knew heartbreakingly because of the restrictions on access that those messages were coming from members of the New York Law School community, you know, faculty members or students or, or staff members. Likewise, when the internet first appeared on the public and political and media radar screen in the early 1990s. Of course, it had been known to scientists before that, but when the general public first became aware of it, there was this enormous uh, moral panic, we would now say, about the danger of this powerful new communications medium. The very aspects of it that made civil libertarians and human rights activists very excited that you could communicate more quickly, more cheaply with more people all over the world. Well, that's very dangerous. And um, I tell my students so they can understand the importance of the Supreme Court decision that, that bucked the popular tide here. Um, that there was then a very influential magazine, I think it still barely exists, called Time Magazine, very widely circulated, very, I don't know what the, today's standard would be because we have so many diffuse media, but you know, most educated people were reading it. Uh, there was a cover uh, on Time Magazine that showed a computer screen, this was to depict the danger of the internet, and there was a monster you know, horrible, you know, scary monster leaping out of the computer screen and grabbing a child. Uh, and the idea was that children were going to be endangered uh, by the availability of this medium. So Congress greeted it with the same type of measure that has greeted all new communications media throughout history, going back to the printing press, with a law heavily censoring it, which almost nobody voted against on either side of the aisle. It was signed by President Bill Clinton, a liberal Democrat, and the arguments were, well, yeah, of course we were wrong about the dangers of the printing press, and of course we were wrong about the dangers of television and radio, and you name every new medium had been graded this way. But this really is different. So this time, we really do need to protect children from the danger of the internet. And you know, thank goodness for judicial review. Uh, as I said, almost nobody in Congress voted against it. But the Supreme Court unanimously struck it down under the First Amendment in a case that I'm very proud to say is uh, goes down in history under the name of Reno, that was Bill Clinton's Attorney General, Janet Reno, versus ACLU. And so, you know, we, I, I, I always, to have this historic humility, I have to say I'm sure that we are engaging in some discriminatory, you know, uh, conduct, uh, that we are benighted in our, or limited in our views of civil liberties that a future generation is going to look back on and say, how can you do that? Yeah, I don't know whether future generations will won't look back on us uh, that way. I suspect you're probably uh, right, but of course they might be wrong. That's true. I, I think the key thing to bear in mind is, is not the question, how will history judge us? Mm -hmm. It's the recognition that we all have that right now, right now, all of us, beginning with me, but all of you, and everybody out there in Princeton and in New Jersey and in the country and in the world, right now, has some beliefs in his or her head that are false. Mm -hmm. right? If I ask the question, how many of you have only true beliefs in your head? You, you, you have no false beliefs. <laughs> Not a single hand would go up. 
because all of us recognize our fallibility when, when, we're, when we focus on it. Now, now, sometimes we forget, and we find ourselves behaving as if we're infallible. But uh, all of us recognize our own fallibility. But it's also the case, and I think we would all recognize it, correct me if you think I'm wrong about this, that among the beliefs that we could very well be wrong about, among the unsound, incorrect beliefs in our head, are not just beliefs about trivial, insignificant, unimportant matters, but we're quite likely wrong about some big, important, significant matters, matters of human dignity, human value, the human, human rights, as I said earlier. Um, that's a pretty good reason mm -hmm. not to immunize ourselves from critique, mm -hmm. not to put some of our views or any of our views out of bounds for, for challenge. That should prompt us to be willing not only to allow other people to speak, even if what they're saying strikes us as really bad, crazy, unjust, wicked, allow people to make their case but also to listen in a spirit of wanting to learn. Um, not uncritically, obviously. People do believe some really evil things, crazy things. But we might be among them without knowing them. Um, there's a beautiful part of the Yom Kippur liturgy in the Jewish community. Uh, Yom Kippur for our non-Jewish friends is the um, Day of Atonement uh, where uh, repentance is, is sought corporately. It's not like a Catholic confession where you go individually. But corporately the community gathers on the Day of Atonement to repent from sins and it does require the confession of sins. Again, corporately. And there's a beautiful part where in the congregation we strike our breasts and say, we have lied, we have stolen, we have committed adultery. We have borne false witness against our neighbor. And then, and this is so telling, this, this, this captures so much wisdom. We strike our best and say, we have been zealots for bad causes. Now, as far as I know, you don't commit adultery by accident. <laughs> you don't bear false witness against your neighbor by accident. But with being a zealot for a bad cause, who's a zealot by, for a bad cause on purpose? We're only zealots for bad causes because we think our causes are good. We're convinced that our causes are good. But what the wisdom of that liturgy tells us is we might be wrong even about that. So we need to be open to challenge, open to criticism. And I think that's the spirit of, um, free, of, of the genuine commitment to free speech, where free speech is understood not simply as an abstract right, or even as something that we should recognize and, and acknowledge for other people, just to be fair. After all, we want, our, we want to be able to speak our minds. It's only fair that we let you speak your mind. I think it goes deeper than that. If we're really serious about self-criticism, if we're really serious about truth-seeking, if we want to swap out as many of the false beliefs in our head as we can, especially about the big important questions, for true beliefs, that's the real reason <laughs> to not only respect free speech formally, but to get into the game, be willing to listen. Re really, what I'm saying here echoes what we learned from John Stuart Mill, the great English uh, theorist of civil liberty. Uh, in the second chapter of his book on liberty. Now, I, full, full disclosure, I've made something of a career out of being a critic of John Stuart Mill. I'm critical of Mill's utilitarianism. I'm critical of, of Mill's libertarianism. But I think he really nails it in that second chapter of On Liberty, which is the chapter title, entitled Of Liberty of Speech and Discussion. Um, or, yeah, I think that's it. The, some, the title's very much like that. Um, because there he makes the point that the real basis, the real ground of recognizing the, importance of free, recognizing the importance of free speech is that we need it to get at the truth of things, to overcome error, to swap out those false beliefs for, for true beliefs. He, he says if, if you and I disagree about something, we're having a discussion, there are only a limited number of possibilities. You may be right and I might be wrong. 
But if, as a result of my allowing you to challenge me, allowing you to speak, you persuade me of the error of my ways and move me from error to truth, then I should be very happy. I should be very grateful. Thank God I, I was open. Thank God I had the liberty. You had the liberty to challenge me. The other possible, another possibility is you might be partially right but partially wrong, and I might be partially right and partially wrong. If as a result of our discussion, and you're having the freedom to challenge me, I can correct the part that I'm wrong about, then again, I should only be grateful to you and grateful that you had the freedom to challenge me and consider myself fortunate that I was willing to listen. But then he takes the hardest case. What if it turns out, just as a matter of from the God's eye perspective, you are entirely wrong and I am entirely right. What have I got to benefit? What's the point of letting you speak? What's the point of listening to you? Here I think Noel makes a really powerful point. He says, even if that's the case, by listening to your challenges, entertaining your objections, having to think about what the answers to your questions are, I will deepen my understanding of what I know. I will deepen my understanding of the truth. After all, it's one thing to know that something is the case. So you check the right box on the SAT score. It's something else and something much better, much deeper to know why it's the case, how it's the case, how it stands up against an intelligent challenge, how it relates to other truths that may be there, other things that may be the case, perhaps even the deeper existential significance of its of its being the case. I don't know about you, but I've learned a tremendous amount. My knowledge has been profoundly deepened in arguments or discussions with people who I am convinced to this moment were absolutely wrong about something really important. What is there not to like about that? And how tragic would it be if I had the power and exercised the power to shut that person down? Because he was wrong. Yeah, uh, well, very generative comments, um, which spur three major points that, that I would like to make. Uh, first, especially because March is Women's History Month, but uh, 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 of general importance, uh, John Stuart Mill's On Liberty, written in 1859, really, in my view, stands the test of time. Every time I reread it, I find it to be the most powerful compelling defense of free speech, uh, including the very important points that Ravi so well summarized. Uh, but what's really, the point I want to make about it now goes to the authorship, because John Stuart Mill begins on liberty with the most effusive praise and tribute to his wife, Harriet Taylor, and her contribution. I'm sorry I can't quote it now, but to paraphrase it, he gives her credit for having inspired every word and every thought. And in fact, he delayed having it published after he had, it, it, the writing was completed, because she was very ill, and he wanted her to go over it one more time. Uh, and then she died. And a lot of people have speculated, why didn't he treat her and respect, her, you know, refer to her openly as a co-author? given this all but doing so with this effusive tribute at the beginning. And people have speculated that maybe it was because she was dying and she could not consent to it. But recently, a team of forensic experts at a university in Britain, I'm sorry, I can't remember which one it was, um, have used algorithmic techniques that are used to uh, trace writing styles and patterns uh, as a means of attributing authorship. And they have very strongly concluded that she is at least a co-author, if not the primary author of major portions of On Liberty. And given the underrepresentation of women in having written what are now recognized as classic works of philosophy, I think that's worth noting. So I, I like to refer to uh, John Stuart Mill and Harriet Taylor as the authors of, the, of that wonderful uh, piece. The second point I want to make is something that I must admit was very startling to me and certainly changed my preconceptions, dispelled a false idea on my part, and that is that those of us who are well-educated and uh, read a lot and think a lot 
um, and probably are, you know, would score well on intelligence tests. Um, actually, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that we are more prone to cognitive biases than people who are less intelligent and less well-educated. I've been reading about this lately um, in writings for the Heterodox Academy blog and more learned uh, scholarly publications that have been compiled by Musa Algarbi, who has just gotten his PhD from uh, Columbia and is about to go teach at, at SUNY Stony Brook. And there are reasons for it, I guess, because we have the arrogance, for, you know, to put it quite plainly, that we think, oh, if we believe it, it really must be true. Uh, so one of the nice things about being aware of your cognitive biases is that it should reinforce that sense of humility and, and open-mindedness. So I say to all of us here in this room, you know, beware. Uh, we definitely have at least as many false ideas as, as other people do. Um, the third point I'd like to make, you know, Robbie, goes back to your question uh, or your statement, who we all have false ideas, who among here has only true ideas. And it, it's a corresponding um, basis for humility and uh, with respect to our own ideas and uh, full-throated tolerance. Tolerance sounds like such a, a stingy word. You know, embracing of other people's ideas and openness and receptivity to them. And that is that all of us have ideas that are important to us that are deeply controversial and unpopular and probably even hated or reviled by some constituent unit in our society. And I'd like to say this to students at campuses which, let's face it, most of the prestigious uh, universities and colleges now are overwhelmingly progressive. So you see students having this self-confidence that you know, their progressive opinions are going to meet with the approval of their immediate community. And to be sure, that's true on campus. But often, even if you go beyond, just beyond the campus community to the town in which the campus is located. I think of Oberlin, mm. for example. You know, just the immediate town, the students' progressive ideas are deeply unpopular. And then you go to the state level or to the national level. So if you want your own ideas to be protected, you cannot rely on, you know, the little bubble in which those ideas may be popular. You also have to have those ideas protected by people who will have power over you who view your ideas as, as unpopular. And hopefully, you will return the favor. Mm -hmm. uh, to correct my uh, uh, chapter title for chapter two of the Mill on Liberty, it's of liberty and thought, of thought and discussion, of liberty of thought and discussion, which, which, is, um, which is important. I mean, liberty of thought and not just liberty of speech have historically come under attack and are in some places under attack now. Well, uh, Nadine, let's turn to the question, what's the counter-argument? Yeah. What's the argument against free speech? Uh, Nadine and I are big advocates of free speech, and we think we need free speech to get at the truth, and we need to hear counter-arguments and seriously entertain counter-arguments. What are the counter-arguments? Well, historically, of course, the concern was that some sorts of speech will do harm, damage, undermine, threaten, public health, safety, and morals, the very reasons we have laws. Public health, safety, and morals, and the advancement of the, of the common good. And I would say two things about that. Number one, public health, safety, and morals are really important values. They are why we have laws. And lots of laws to protect public health, safety, and morals are legitimate laws. That's number one. Number two, speech can threaten all of those things, public health, safety, and morals. And whatever Mill and Taylor may have thought, Thank you. and here I'll go to a point on which I think I disagree with Mill, um, although his own view on the matter is not absolutely completely clear, um, I don't think we've got any guarantee that by respecting free speech, in the end, the truth will come out. 
any guarantee that by respecting free speech, everything will come out okay for the public wheel, for the public good. I would make the more modest claim. I think it's a good bet. I think truth has a better chance of winning out in conditions of freedom, and that we ourselves have a better chance of getting at the truth if we allow ourselves to be challenged and we engage people who disagree with us in a truth-speaking seeking spirit. But there's not a, a, a guarantee. Life doesn't come with a guarantee, not individual lives, not our, our corporate lives. So if somebody says, gee, that's risky to, to allow for free speech there, they could, people could pass out all sorts of misinformation and disinformation. What's the latest one? Malinformation. Malinformation. And as a which result, is, which is true, but could still be dangerous. Yeah, people could get sick, people could die, uh, the terrorists could infiltrate, they could communicate in ways that will enable them to blow up buildings and blow up airplanes. And, and I, I think that the defender of free speech makes a mistake. It's just not true to say that couldn't happen. Now, just respect free speech, everything will come out okay. Free speech can never have bad consequences. Free speech can have bad consequences. I think it's a bet. Do we think on the whole we're better off, the public wheel is better off, the cause of truth seeking for universities is better off, but for students, for faculty members, researchers, ordinary people just wanting to get at the truth of things, is it, are we better off respecting freedom of speech? And that's a bet I would make, but I have to acknowledge it's a bet. I don't think there's a guarantee, I don't think there's some law of history that guarantees that in the end everything comes out as, uh, as roses. Now, in the contemporary situation, we have something that, if not new, is a different manifestation of what we've seen before when it comes to concerns about free speech. And that is a different form of harm that sometimes goes these days by the label dignitarian harm. We can't allow free speech because if we allow free speech, or complete free speech, or unfettered free speech, or free speech in this university, or free speech in this dormitory, it will be used to personally attack people because of their identities, harming their dignity, making them feel like outsiders, uh, undermining their perception of themselves as people with, who are respected in this community and are fully parts of this community. Now, I think there are a whole lot of things that are wrong with that. But not everything is wrong about that. We can, with our speech, insult people. Sometimes our views are genuinely offensive. Sometimes our views do make people feel not only bad, but feel like they're being made to be outsiders. So I think that argument, though I, in the end, reject it, has to be taken seriously and has to be met. Yeah. Um, I honestly can't remember exactly what Mill and Taylor said about whether speech would lead to the truth. I don't remember that representation. I do know for sure that when Oliver Wendell Holmes, the Supreme Court Justice who uh, first started dissenting from the decisions that were giving very limited scope to free speech, uh, when the court first started um, trying to enforce the First Amendment in the early 20th century. He's the one who coined the famous marketplace of ideas metaphor. And he never said that the marketplace of ideas would lead toward truth. Uh, rather, he said that it was exactly as you paraphrased it, Robbie, um, less risky than government suppression as a means to try to arrive at the truth. He also said it's an experiment, as all life is an experiment. And my own conclusion is that free speech does not guarantee that we will arrive at the truth, but censorship guarantees that we will not arrive at the truth. You know, I keep thinking of the famous metaphor that uh, Winston Churchill had about democracy, that it's the worst form of government except for all the others. I think free speech, you know, is very dangerous, except it's less dangerous yeah. than the alternative. And, you know, the more, the, uh, I told you I, I wrote this book called Free Speech, What Everyone Needs to Know, and the, it's a series that is in question and answer format. 
And the very first question that I ask at the beginning of the book is, you know, very much in the Millie and Taylor uh, spirit, um, what are the 12, I just picked, you know, a round number, the 12 strongest arguments against free speech? And I really wanted to use that as a challenge to myself. And it's based on having given more than 1,000 talks or presentations, which include questions, including very challenging questions over the past half dozen or so years. Um, and I really you know, tried to grapple with them and, and my basic conclusion. First of all, what I realized from um, the in-depth uh, uh, steeping in First Amendment law is that it really is very sensible. It is not this caricatured um, straw person version of free speech that a lot of those who are hostile to it attack. Oh, it is absolute. It denies that speech can ever do any harm. It believes that speech will necessarily lead to the truth. No, none of that is part of our First Amendment jurisprudence. Um, Our law does sensibly permit government to outlaw the speech that is the most dangerous, namely when the speech has a tight and direct imminent connection to certain specific serious harm. And the Supreme Court has recognized many categories of speech that satisfy what is often called the emergency standard, and you've heard many of them intentional incitement of imminent violence, a true threat, targeted bullying or harassment, uh, defamation, perjury, the list goes on. So when the speech is the most dangerous, the most harmful, it may be outlawed. But correspondingly, First Amendment law also outlaws the censorship that is the most dangerous. What is the most dangerous form of censorship in a democratic society. It is censorship based solely on disapproval, even loathing of the idea or the viewpoint of the speech, not connected to any specific harm other than I hate that idea, or I think that idea is hateful, or I think that maybe Perhaps at some future point, the speech might lead to harm. That's the standard we used to have in this country before the emergency standard. It was called the bad tendency test. And no wonder, under the bad tendency test, any speech that was critical of the status quo, that sought to promote human rights or any dissident minority perspective, was seen as, well, that has a bad tendency. Um, So I think that um, when you really examine the law, I continue to believe that uh, it is appropriately respectful of harm uh, and empowers government to deal with it, but without giving the government the license solely to persecute unpopular ideas. And the reason I, I, I like to say I continue to believe that is to underscore that I also continue to welcome counter arguments, to welcome new evidence, to welcome new analysis, and maybe I will be uh, persuaded that free speech does go too far in this country. Yeah. So far not, but. Maybe, maybe that was an excellent summary of the state of, uh, of our law. And uh, students who've taken constitutional interpretation or civil liberties will recognize what Ms. Strassen just summed up as the Brandenburg standard. So this was the 1969 case involving a Ku Klux Klan wizard uh, in Ohio who was prosecuted under the anti-syndicalism uh, statute. And the Supreme Court in that case vindicated his First Amendment free speech rights, although what he, the things he was saying were horrible, absolutely horrible on the ground that they did not meet the emergency standard. That is, they were not designed to, nor were they uh, uh, causing an imminent threat of violence and breach of the speech, uh, breach breach of the peace. That's the standard that has to be met if you are to punish, outlaw or punish, or in some way 
sanction uh, uh, speech, if that is to say you are the government. Now remember, as Nadine pointed out, the First Amendment does not run against General Motors or Microsoft or Twitter or, or Facebook. We have a different set of questions about what should be the posture of free speech champions toward these large private uh, entities, corporations and, uh, and others. But as far as the government's authority to regulate speech is concerned, the Brandenburg standard is our law. And as far as I can tell, uh, correct me if I'm wrong about this, Nadine, I think it's supported by our current Supreme Court unanimously. unanimously. It was decided yeah. unanimously. I'm very proud that it was an ACLU case. And I'm also very proud that the counsel of record for the ACLU uh, was a then young lawyer. Many of you will have heard the name Boy, subsequently. Ava. No, Eleanor Holmes North, oh, an yeah. African-American yeah. woman who was the... DC uh, rep. Yeah, she's yeah. now been the longtime DC representative in Congress, and she was very recently interviewed about the case. And uh, she was very active in all kinds of civil rights organizations in addition to the ACLU could not be more committed to equal rights, more opposed to Brandenburg's Brandenburg speech, ideology, right. as indeed was the whole ACLU. And she continues to be very, very proud of it because she said she knew that the primary, or among the primary beneficiaries, would be her friends who in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and others who were uh, we're championing civil rights. And by the way, you know, this is true for the NAACP and Martin Luther King. They were all opposed to censoring even hate speech uh, that was racist because they knew that their speech would be uh, among the first to be targeted, and as indeed it was um, throughout the South and also in, in certain uh, other parts of the country. Nadine, it seems to me, and I wonder what your view is on this, that under the Brandenburg standard, uh, we have the explanation for why Donald Trump mm -hmm. cannot and will not be prosecuted, whatever else he may be prosecuted for, for his January 6th speech. There are some people who argue that Trump should be prosecuted for inciting the assault on the US uh, Capitol. This brings the Brandenburg case center stage. So the question is, do Donald Trump's remarks meet the standard that has to be met if you're to prosecute under Brandenburg? It looks to me like the answer to that is pretty clearly no, but I'm wondering if you may disagree. Uh, so as with all First Amendment standards, it's very fact-specific. Uh, the exact standard is the speaker has to intentionally mm -hmm. incite imminent violence or lawlessness that is likely to happen imminently. And the Supreme Court distinguished what it called mere advocacy of lawlessness or violence is completely constitutionally protected. Incitement is a different matter. And every fact is, is relevant. Um, in, so I think to prove intent is quite difficult. Uh, and when you look at the language that Trump used, a lot of it was incendiary, but he also said something like, go in peace, uh, which may be enough to get him out from under the Brandenburg standard. I should say there actually was an attempt to hold him liable under that standard when he was running for president in 2016. At one of his campaign rallies um, somewhere in the Midwest, uh, there were some anti-Trump demonstrators who had no right to be at a Trump rally, and so he urged some of his supporters to get them out of here, get them out of here. I think he said punch them. Uh, I, I know he didn't say that, he but they were that. in yeah. fact uh, assaulted, and they say oh, that they were yeah. injured. And he had some other tough rhetoric, such as, you know, in the old days we would pay for your lawyers, right? Mm -hmm. But. The judge who ruled on that case said, well, it's a close question. But it, it, Trump also said, don't hurt him. Don't oh. hurt him. And, and the judge said that tipped the balance. So I think that likewise in the January 6th context to say, go in peace, uh, may get him out from under the Brandenburg standard. And regardless of what you think about Trump, let me say, 
always think of a speaker that you think should not be punished, and you want to make sure that your interpretation of the Brandenburg standard, whatever you think about Trump, would also satisfy you in that case. So I can tell you very conveniently the ACLU is always defending people, the free speech rights of people with very different perspectives. Um, a, a couple of years ago, we were in the Supreme Court defending the First Amendment rights of D. Ray McKesson, who is one of the leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement. And he was making a very rabble-rousing, incendiary speech against police abuse and police brutality uh, at a rally at which there was some unrest, and somebody threw a brick at a police officer and injured the police officer. Uh, of course, the person who threw the brick is, is, is culpable. Uh, but has never been found. And there was, however, a lawsuit that was brought by the police officer against the Black Lives Matter movement and against U.A. McKesson. And he was actually held culpable uh, for the injury to the police officer by the lower federal court and by the intermediate court of appeals. So the ACLU represented McKesson in the Supreme Court, and we argued that uh, the Brandenburg standard should be the one that applies, and he should not be held culpable. And that seems to me to be an analogous case. I was explaining this to somebody, and he said, so you're saying that what's good for Trump, what's good for D. Ray McKesson has to be good for Trump. And yep. I guess, yeah. <laughs> That's a wonderful heuristic device. Yeah. So just think of the speaker not as the Nazi Brandenburg who you hate, but of you know, whatever incendiary figure on the other side you may happen to like. Back to the argument against free speech, a, um, uh, an argument that has emerged, in, at least I've only been hearing it for the last year or two, um, is Marcusen, you, the, the uh, uh, repressive tolerance. Yeah, or the uh, repressive tolerance. Repress, repressive right. tolerance yeah. So the Marcusen argument goes something like this. Yeah, free speech, we're for that. But Free speech is only a valid tool in the hands of the marginalized seeking liberation from oppression. That where free speech is given to the powerful and the oppressor, then it becomes a bad thing, a weapon itself of, of oppression. So we don't need to be concerned with the free speech rights of the powerful, only with those of the marginalized, the victim class, the the, uh, the oppressed. When free speech is flexed in the cause of, say, anti-racism, that's good. But when it is some powerful person or some uh, political figure or wealthy person or person who doesn't fit into the victim category, but is rather, at least as a member of a class, a victimizer or an oppressor, uh, that's a different story. You don't have to respect free speech there. In fact, free speech there j is just a cover for oppression. Well, I couldn't uh, disagree with that more for many reasons, uh, one of which is who has power uh, is rather debatable in many circumstances. So I think, for example, of uh, a university situation where one might think that a tenured professor, uh, let's say a white, cis, hetero male, right, um, has all of the indicia of power and security. And a student, let's say a minority female student, um, has, is at the opposite end of the power spectrum. And yet, when you look at the dynamics of many campuses, um, the presumptions and the processes that are in place will not necessarily um, be favorable to the, to the professor. So it's a very subjective determination. Um, beyond that, it seems to me that once you allow somebody to make the determination that certain people, however you define them, whether in terms of power, uh, or any other dynamic are to be privileged and, and others are to be disfavored in terms of their exercise of any rights. Who makes that decision? And do we want to entrust that decision to 
uh, to anybody, whether it be a government official, whether it be a campus official, mm -hmm. whether it be uh, the majority of our community. Uh, again, I come back to our uh, shared hero, Madison, um, among others, I think he wasn't the only one who used the phrase, the tyranny of the, of the majority. Um, so uh, I, 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 th I think that we cannot, just as we cannot discriminate against viewpoints consistent with free speech principles, I think we cannot discriminate based on the identity of the speaker, and the Supreme Court has, has indeed held that. Right. Nadine, let me ask you uh, about another form of tyranny. Uh, and here I'm going back to our friend Mill, or Mill and Taylor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and that is the tyranny of public opinion, or the tyranny of majority opinion, uh, perhaps in an institution or in a, in a broader yeah. area like the academic world or the intellectual culture or the elite, uh, elite uh, culture. Uh, Mill, uh, in uh, On Liberty, and this is in the introductory chapter, so it's before he's, he's talking about liberty generally now, not just freedom of speech, uh, makes the point that his concern with liberty is not simply a concern with freedom from government coercion, that the values served by liberty, truth-seeking, for example, can also be undermined by the conformism that uh, is the fruit, uh, the groupthink that is the fruit of the tyranny of of public opinion. And when we were chatting at dinner, I'd like you to share it with our group here assembled. You are making the point that there is so much self-censorship now where people are not afraid of the government coming mm -hmm. or even necessarily of their employers, say the university, whatever the board is that, that, uh, that, that may punish the, the disciplinary board for punishing them for saying the wrong thing. They're just worried about the approval of their peers. And not, you were saying at dinner, not just students, it's faculty members, and not just faculty members, tenured faculty members, and not just tenured faculty members, tenured faculty members at the top of the pay scale. They can't be punished. Well, that, that's sort of what I was thinking about when I was thinking of the power of this student to intimidate a tenured professor. But you know, I'm having such a great time chatting with you. Did we talk about giving the audience a chance I think we to... should give the audience. <laughs> I think we should. Although, before we give the audience a chance, we've mentioned Mill. We should mention one other important uh, figure. Mill, Mill uh, is the champion of making the case uh, for freedom as a condition of truth seeking. But something we haven't talked about too much this evening is the importance of freedom, and especially freedom of speech, for good government, especially in a democracy or in, in, in a republic. Uh, and here, the great thinker I have in mind is Alexander mm -hmm. Mickeljohn, mm -hmm. who makes the point that if you're going to run a Republican form of government, that is, uh, government not only of the people, which all government is, uh, and for the people, which all good government is, including the government of a benign despot, but government by the people, the thing that makes Republican government Republican, or what today people prefer to say democracy for some reason, but it doesn't matter, self-government. If you're going to have self-government, the people need to be free to say what's on their minds, even if the governors, the people who are supposed to be representing them, the people they've entrusted with power, don't want to hear it. And they need to be able to argue with each other if they're to make good decisions. After all, it's self-government. They're the ones making the decisions, indirectly perhaps, but nevertheless, making the decisions. How can they make good decisions if they can't speak their minds to each other? And and I would generalize, I'd add Mill to Mickelson here, and say that this goes beyond. If we're, if we're interested in good government, good democratic republican government, mm -hmm. it, we've got to be concerned not simply with coercion, mm -hmm. government coercion, the coercion of law, force, but with groupthink, mm -hmm. conformism, mm -hmm. the conversion, the, 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 uh, the tyranny of public opinion. Yeah. You know, not only um, is the Mill-Taylor piece focused expressly on social pressure, uh, but that was also a concern that went back to Alexis de Tocqueville, uh, the first observer, really, of oh. democracy in America. And he saw that as what was a great threat, the populism that could lead to tyranny of the, of the majority. 
Uh, I, one of my favorite statements from the Supreme Court about the essential relationship between free speech and self-government uh, was when the court said that expression about matters of public concern, which it defines very broadly, anything that has any connection to public policy, is more than a matter of individual self-expression, important as that is. It is the essence of self-government, the essence of self-government. Yes, sir. Uh, well, first of all, thank you both for the second discussion. Um, uh, someone coming from a, a very different context. Oh, wow. Russian. Russian, yeah. I wondered um, specifically about the last thing in your conversation. Whether you might think um, that when it comes to campus, we might need extra protection, protection institutions that could protect tenured professor vis-a-vis uh, -vis student body. And if you think that there is such a what could that institution be? Do I want to talk about the academic freedom of this? Well, well, well yes. First, I, I, I should point out to the audience that you gave a wonderful paper in the Center for Human Values on the situation for Russian academics right now under the Putin uh, re regime and the, the tremendous pressure uh, on uh, Russian uh, scholars uh, to avoid saying anything that could get them in trouble uh, with the with the authorities. Uh, I had the pleasure of being the respondent on that uh, on that paper. Well, um, there are organizations, para academic, you might call them organizations uh, that have been formed historically and and, and being formed even today. Uh, to try to protect academic freedom for scholars, yes, but also for students. Uh, the sort of original, the grandfather of them all was the American Association of University Professors, the AAUP, which in 1915 put out its first formal statement of principles of free speech. And that's still a very important uh, document. Uh, they put out a second statement, much shorter, uh, it was, I think, just before the World War, uh, 1940, yeah, 19, 1940, and that is also worth, worth examining. Um, I think the impetus, correct me if I'm wrong on the history, maybe, I think the impetus was seeing what was happening, and this was concern about the government putting pressure on the university administrations, seeing what was happening to the expression of dissent from the policies of the government in World War I and its aftermath. Do I have that right? I, I'm pretty sure I do. Yeah. And so the National Association was formed to press universities to adopt these principles. And most universities, at least most public universities, and many of the major private universities adopted those principles. And I think they served pretty well, including through what we call the McCarthy uh, period uh, of the 1950s when suspicion of sympathy with communism or sympathy uh, 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 suspicion that somebody was a communist, maybe even the fact that someone was a communist, uh, would be used uh, as a ground for removing that person from an academic post or from opportunities for academic preferment or, or uh, things, things like that. Um, more recently, uh, well, and then of course organizations that weren't uh, exclusively focused on the academic life, like um, ACLU, also took cases involving... The Scopes case, the, right, yeah. one of our earliest cases, was evolution, premised yeah. that on yeah. an academic freedom yeah. uh, theory, the right to teach evolution in public schools. And more recently, new organizations have, have formed some... Uh, the Heterodox Academy is one. Uh, Heterodox Academy, as I understand it, and, and I've been involved on their advisory uh, board, um, perceives that one of the problems for academic freedom is the lack of viewpoint diversity in colleges and universities. The group thinks that conformism creates conditions which jeopardize academic freedom. So Heterodox Academy is concerned about academic freedom, but it's, it's focused on one of what it regards as the principal causes or conditions for the 
threats to academic freedom, the idea of viewpoint diversity. It was founded by Jonathan Haidt, who's a social psychologist at New York uh, University. And then most recently, in uh, exactly two years ago, in March of uh, 2021, uh, I and some others at, at, at Princeton joined with people uh, like Nadine and others uh, at other universities around the country to form the Academic Freedom uh, Alliance. And uh, that was founded on uh, the principle that we find in the NATO Charter, Article 5 of the NATO Charter, which treats an attack on one as an attack on all. So the members of the Academic Freedom Alliance perceived that a problem was that an academic will come under attack for exercising his or her freedom of speech. And other academics, rather than rallying to the defense of their colleague, will scatter in fear, a fear that they would be the next victim or they would suffer guilt by association with the, the victim. So we wanted to bring together people who would be willing to stand up for each other and for each other's rights. And it's an ideologically extremely diverse organization. It extends from Cornell West on, on uh, one side to Amy Wax uh, on the other uh, side and everybody uh, in between. Uh, and uh, that organization uh, not only provides solidarity for uh, professors who come under attack, these cancellation campaigns as they're sometimes called these days, um, but it also will um, intervene with colleges and universities to call them to account if they're violating their own commitments, whether it's the AAUP principles or the principles uh, adopted by the University of Chicago, which have now been adopted by other institutions as well, including Princeton, the University of Chicago free speech principles from 2015. Um, uh, the Academic Freedom Alliance will reach out to a president or a dean and say, you know, what you have done to uh, professor, whoever the professor is, is inconsistent with your own principles. We investigate the case. We make sure and do all the background work. And then finally, our ultimate backup is a legal defense fund. So the members of the Academic Freedom Alliance have an automatic right to have a case that they bring to us considered for paid legal representation. Uh, but, you know, we, we, we have to review the case ourselves to make sure that it's a, it's a meritorious case. But if it's a meritorious case, we have a legal defense fund that enables the professor to fight back. Very often, uh, the, the power uh, disparity, the power mismatch uh, creates a problem because the universities, in many cases, not all cases, there are poor universities, but there are rich universities like Princeton. And they can afford uh, to try to wear out the professor they're litigating against by running up his legal fees. And the professor, being an academic, not the highest paid profession, uh, you know, will have a meritorious case, but doesn't want to be bankrupted. And so doesn't litigate or doesn't defend himself. Well, we, we tried to take care of that problem. I would be remiss if I didn't add to that excellent list, FIRE, the Foundation oh, for my Individual goodness, absolutely, Rights and yeah. Expression, uh, which had originally for many, many years been the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education uh, and is preeminent in advocating on behalf of um, faculty and students all over the country, but recently felt beholden to expand its mission beyond universities, but it's still an expert there. You know, as I hear this litany of organizations, I'm active in all of them. It's, you know, it's in, on the one hand, it's heartening that we've had a proliferation and an expansion of organizations that are committed to free speech, especially on campus, but it's also um, an indication of how dire the situation is, that there is such a felt need uh, for these yeah. groups. Uh, FIRE, Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, mm -hmm. only in education, uh, is a public interest law firm. So it's different from the Academic Freedom Alliance, which is an alliance or the Heterodox Academy, uh, or for that matter, the AAUP. Uh, it is a public interest law firm that litigates on behalf of victims of, uh, of uh, academic freedom violations. And it's not a membership organization. So unlike the Academic Freedom Alliance, you don't have to be a member of FIRE for them to take your case if the case is meritorious. The problem is, as Greg Lukianoff, the president of of, uh, of FIRE uh, mentioned to me recently, the enormous increase they've experienced uh, is overwhelming them. Uh, I believe they now are up to something like 70 or 80 mm -hmm. 
employees. So they're, they're getting to be a very large public interest law firm, and yet they cannot take any more than a fraction of the cases that they would like to take because there are so many cases from around the country. And they come from the right and from the left. In the state universities, very often the problem is from the conservative side, you know, state legislators or, or, or regents who are violating people's academic freedom rights. In private universities, especially elite universities, they're most often from the, from the left, the attacks on academic freedom. Uh, the violation of academic freedom seems to be an equal opportunity business. Uh, they'll go after people on the right or the left, and, the, and, the, and, the, and it can be in the name of either right-wing or left-wing ideology. Yep. You know, Jonathan Haidt and other social psychologists who are experts on human behavior and motivations um, cite many studies about the conformity bias, uh, which is kind of discouraging, including among well-educated people. But the counter evidence from social psychology, and I'm sure there are people in the audience who are experts, I'm just quoting experts, I'm not one myself, um, there are studies that show that once one person bucks the conformist tide, it's much easier for other people to join up. I, I cited over our dinner conversation uh, one situation where one person speaking up continued to be an outlier. Nobody came to her defense. But um, I think that, that to me is the beauty of the Academic Freedom Alliance. Once you're not alone, there may not be somebody on your own campus, but you've got this wonderful, impressive array of people behind you, and hopefully that would embolden others to, to speak up, including on your own campus. And I don't know if that's been proven to be the case in the experience of AFA. Yes, in our experience it has been. Um, I've got good news and bad news. The good news is that courage is contagious. If someone models it, if someone exemplifies it, other people are willing to step up and do courageous things. The bad news is the same is true of cowardice. Mm -hmm. It's contagious. If, if people see other people cowering, mm -hmm. other people holding back out of fear, not standing up for a colleague who has been unjustly attacked or had his or her academic freedom violated, uh, you're more likely to get cowardice. Um, so we need at least a few people to get the ball rolling by standing up boldly. And it's really important that there be models of people standing up for the academic freedom rights of people who are known to be of the opposite political or moral or religious viewpoint from theirs. That's really critical. If, if all people see is we stand up for the people on our side, but we don't stand up for the people on the other side, that's a really bad right. message. And there I, needs to be models of people standing up. Well, like you were talking about the ACLU and the Brandenburg right. case. I mean, you know, Brandenburg was a Nazi. He was. Yeah. And I think it's also really important for each of us to be critical of our political tribe when they are engaging in censorship. Yeah. And, and you know, it's easy to criticize the other guys for censoring opinions that, that you disagree with. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, can I be uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I grew up in it, um, and I'm not currently in it. Um, I witnessed many, many decades of um, academic powers um, that came both from the top and from the bottom. Um, from the students as well. Because I'm thinking mainly about the 60s. And when we talk about how free speech really can only be successful in a true um, democracy, it takes courage. And I love that you're talking about courage right now. And, and I'm and thinking about models. And one of the great models 
uh, was um, at a meeting. Uh, oh, the University of Chicago. Yes, President of the University of Chicago became Attorney General of the United States. Edward Levy. Yep. Oh, yes. Another great University of Chicago law professor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, and I feel like a number of other presidents of universities that the Well, uh, the first name that would come to mind when you mention Edward Levy, of course, would be his successor in at the University of Chicago. I, I, there may have been, I think there were professors in H Hannah Gray, and then uh, Bob Zimmer, Robert Robert Zimmer, and Robert Zimmer was put to the test fairly recently. He he has since stepped down. At, not not he wasn't forced out or he just retired a normal retirement from the University of Chicago. But that was very recent. The new president, very very new. Let me tell you how Zimmer showed his mettle. I mean, he, you know, he spoke out about freedom of speech and spoke out about the Chicago principles and so forth, promoted them. But lots of presidents speak about freedom of speech. It's when you're really put to the test. At Chicago, there is a geo, a geophysicist uh, named Dorian Abbott, a very distinguished scholar in his geophysicist Dorian, Dorian Abbott. Abbott. And uh, uh, Dorian Abbott, uh, there's no, nobody questions the quality of uh, his science. Uh, but he has, in addition to his scientific uh, professional writing, has uh, spoken out in public forums, written newspaper op-eds and so forth, in which he advocates what he calls merit-based hiring in the sciences. He's made the case that in hiring for scientific positions, research and teaching positions. It's very important that the only criteria be quality of mind, quality of scholarship, quality of research, achievement, accomplishment, promise. That we shouldn't take into account other factors of the sort that sometimes go under the label these days, DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion. Well, as a result of speaking this opinion, which is very unpopular in the academic world, at least right now, including at the University of Chicago, uh, he came under fire, and the petition was ginned up, and there was a big, it became a national controversy where there was pressure to punish, to fire, to get rid of Dorian uh, Abbott, who's a tenured professor. And uh, to his very great credit, Zimmer did not let this go on very long. It went on, I think, just for a few days, if I remember correctly. Uh, Sylvain, you may correct me if I'm wrong on this. I don't think it was more than a few days. Yeah, not and, even that long. And not even that long, Nadine says. And, and Zimmer just put out a statement that was very clear. Chicago believes in free speech. We don't punish people for their opinions. Doesn't matter whether I agree with those opinions or disagree. Now notice he also didn't say something like, well, I condemn what the man said, but of course he has the right to say it. No, Zimmer did it right. He prescinded from saying anything about the substance of the issue. He said simply, we believe in free speech. Chicago believes free speech is absolutely essential as a condition for the truth-seeking mission of the university. Nobody is punished for their opinions at Chicago. And that ended it. It actually ended it. Right. As there was a case of standing up to the people who wanted to punish people for speech. And it what happens when they st somebody stands up to the back down? Exactly. And, and Dorian Abbott was the professor whose uh, prestigious title lecture about geophysics at MIT was canceled by MIT because of the same kind of pressure. And I, I don't understand why university presidents don't do what Zimmer did, even putting aside the free speech benefits, because it is most effective in quelling the controversy. If you apologize or condemn uh, or worse yet, cancel, it, ju it doesn't end the controversy. It just fuels the fire. Oh, the apology wasn't strong enough. 
the condemnation wasn't strong enough. I don't understand why, from a time management perspective, other presidents don't do that. Um, but let me throw out another model, Emily, and that's Ruth Simmons, um, who has gone on to lead other universities, most recently historically black college in, in Texas, um, Prairie View, I think it's called. Uh, but uh, quite a few years ago, she became the first African-American president of any Ivy League university when she became president of Brown. And I think she was also the first female, she was the first female president of Brown. And Brown at that time had already had its battles with what was then called political correctness and stealing of whole issues of a newspaper that had an op-ed that the students thought was controversial. And in her opening convocation address, she decided to make this an issue. And I actually have the words memorized because they were so powerful. She said, education is the antithesis of comfort. The antithesis of comfort. Any of you who come here seeking comfort, go through yon iron gate. <laughs> so she was basically saying, I'm not going to step down. You leave if that's what you're here for. Cornell West sometimes says that the whole point of a liberal arts education is to unsettle the student. I think there's a lot of truth to that. How did that get lost? That's a very good question, a complicated one. Uh, a lot of blame to go, go around, and not, not all blame goes in one direction uh, on that. Um, just a couple of just off the top of my head reflections. Uh, the mission of the university, the, the, we, people ask the mission of the university. Uh, for example, we began thinking of universities primarily as, and this isn't bad as a secondary thing, but it gets bad if it's primary, as primarily educating the workforce for their futures. When you go down that road, careerism replaces the quest for truth. The, the fundamental, constitutive, foundational mission is no longer truth-seeking. It's credentialing and equipping with certain skills and, and, and so forth. Um, so that's, that's, that's bad. Another thing is imagining that the mission of the university is social change, social justice, change the world, make the world a better place. That's, again, not bad. But when it displaces the constitutive, foundational mission of, of truth-seeking, then it's, then it's bad. So I think, uh, I'm, I'm pontificating here, <laughs> excuse me, Nadine, but I think that if the university remains true to its the mission that justifies its existence, the truth-seeking mission, the, the, the pursuit of truth, the, the, the transmission of knowledge, the creating students who are lifelong learners, genuine self-critic, lifelong, self-critical lifelong learners. Uh, if the university stays true to that, it can do lots of other things. It can prepare students for good careers where they'll make a lot of money, hope to give some of it back to their alma maters and, and, and so mm -hmm. forth. Uh, they can, uh, universities can do athletics, there's nothing wrong with having athletics. But if athletics becomes the, the dominant thing, if it becomes what the university is about, where, where I grew up in West Virginia, when I was growing up, I hope things are better now at the university. You'll be visiting there. You'll, you can tell. But I mean, there was a point, I can remember it very well, when people didn't think of West Virginia University as a university in the sense of an academic institution. It was thought of as a sports powerhouse. But just out of whack then, right? Sports is fine if it's subsidiary. It's not fine when it becomes the primary thing, what the university is, is all about. Uh, same with all the, the, the political organizations, you know, the Republican Club and the Democrat Club and the Libertarians and the Socialists and the Social Justice People and the Pro-Life Group and everybody else. That's all fine. That's all good. That's great on campus. But if that becomes the mission and displaces the, the truth-seeking mission, it's not fine anymore. I think that um, some of the strands that would explain this sad transformation, in addition to the ones that, that Robbie has elucidated, are laid out in a book called The Coddling of the American Mind, co-authored by Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff. And in addition to those factors, they talk about changes in parenting and you know, kids being um, 
brought up by helicopter parents and, 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 and emphasizing safetyism and overly protecting kids. And, and some of the, uh, the impetuses are very positive, you know, the very strong motive to be concerned about bullying and to be protective of uh, concerned about other people. There becomes a, a, an over tendency to protect against harmful, harmful words. Um, again, words can be harmful, but the yeah. protection is doing more harm than good. Ruth Simmons' point there is very applicable. If you want to be comfortable, if you want to be safe, uh, if you want to be settled, you shouldn't be in a, a university is not a place for you if it's a real university. Well, with that, let me thank everyone for coming out, and thank you to Stuart Taylor and Ed Union and Thank you.